Hey guys, Sigfried11 here. Now, 2021 was a big year for gaming, at least for me, because I played a wide variety of consoles and got to enjoy a wide variety of games. So I thought of maybe ranking them. Now, if you guys enjoy this, maybe it'll become an annual series where I rank the games that I played among the year. But I'm so excited to share this list, and it was so hard to rank the games. Like, the top five is completely interchangeable. Any of these games could go in any position. It's so difficult. But anyways, I hope you enjoy the list. Also, if you want to check out some of my game reviews and other things like that, I do have an account on how long to beat. You can also always see whenever I complete a new game. Now this game was actually a huge disappointment for me because I had wanted it for a long time and when I eventually got it, it just felt really boring. Now, I got the main story and I got all the optional pixels and the game was okay. Some of the levels were really good, but other ones took absolutely forever and were very boring. And by the time I completed the game, I was just kind of ready to move on. So. Basically, one of the problems is, is the characters won't shut up and they'll just always talk and continuously talk. As I said, the levels are long and boring, and this game was really insanely easy. Or like, quite a bit of challenge to the point where it wasn't fun because they just like to spam enemies. Now this was actually my first Paper Mario game, so I've heard it's not much like the others, which means I'm not gonna raid off the entire series of Paper Mario, and I think I'm gonna try the other games too. Next up we have Smash Bros Brawl, and I actually just did a, the story mode on this game, which was the subspace emissary. Now think of a normal story mode or a side mode for a Smash Bros game, you might think maybe it's 3 hours long. No, this one was 8 hours, the length of a pretty good game, which means it kind of dragged on quite a bit, and it also would have been cool for the environment. Or things from like the different video games like Smash Bros is, you could have some ones from Legend of Zelda, Earthbound, Pokemon, Mario of course, Star Fox, but they just kind of use generic locations like the forest, the beach, the lake, the castle. So it felt quite uninspired. It was pretty alright, it definitely got me used to combat in Smash Bros games and it was really cool how instead of having you pick from a wide list of characters, it would give you two or three and you have to pick which ones you could play as. Just for permission. So that was really fun because it got you used to all the different styles of the characters. And it also got me picking my favorite characters for when I play Smash in the future with my friends. But yeah, as I said, it was kind of uninspired and it dragged on for a while. But I was very happy when they had the final level where you went back to all the places even though it was like an hour long. And I mean, it was cool playing as all the different Smash characters. And this one hurts. I was really hoping I'd like this game because of the amazing puzzles and the aesthetic that it carried. Yet, like the past two games, it did feel the drag on, even though it had a very short length. So, for the first third, it was... It felt very fresh and it was really fun because everything is up to kill you. There's also other kids there who are also trying to kill you. And the third, third felt really cool because you were doing cool switch and gravity things. You were smashing through glass, by the way, that felt amazing. But the second third was just filled with nothing but puzzles and it felt so boring. So as I said, I was very happy with the end part but the second part was just filled with puzzles. I couldn't find too much of a drive to power through. However, I'm happy that I did. Now, while it was short, I did feel like it was very long. Now, as I said, my respect for this game is huge, and I can see where fans come from, but I just felt like it was not for me. This game was really fun, so it almost felt like a Monty Python movie because of all the random pieces of humor and the gags and stuff. Basically, you play as a spy doing, you know, spy things. You go into all these different locations. It's just wacky. I felt like I was on a drug trip the whole time. Now, I think everyone should play this game. 
if it's on sale because it has a very short runtime and limited replayability. Now, you also can't rush through it. You have to explore everything to kind of get the most out of it. Otherwise, it could actually be only about an hour long. So, I think this game was really fun. But again, it did have a short runtime, so it was kind of lacking in essence. But also, you know, the jokes were just so good. If you have a random sense of humor, you'll absolutely love this game. Now this is another game that greatly rewards people with a very random sense of humor because the entire game is just pure comedy, like the last one. Now most of the comedy comes with you fumbling around with the controls and that's just because the controls are insanely hard to use. But that's where the fun of the game comes in. Most of the jokes are actually created by yourself just messing around, you know, throwing yourself into the fire, throwing chocolate milk at your kids, that kind of stuff. Throwing a poster in the sink, you know, while your wife's using it. But anyways, I played this game twice, once by myself, once with a friend. Both times it was utterly hilarious, especially with your friend where the controls change every time you do a mission. And although it was short, it had the same feeling that Jazz Pump did where it felt long and it felt like the story wrapped up nice. There's also a bonus 40 minutes of shorts, which was quite a nice addition. And the opening title was just amazing. The music was great. I also liked how at the end, you know, they had a little credit scene, but it was at a movie theater and they were talking about how the movie was really bad. The movie is the game you're playing, by the way. Anyways, it was really cool. I would recommend this to lots of people. This next game is not insanely well known, unless if you were active on the 3DS. So it's basically taking the running gun levels from Cuphead and making an entire game out of that. And yes, I know this game came out before Cuphead, but you know, I gotta draw some comparison from somewhere. So I found the game was pretty good and the bosses reminded me, as I said, a lot of Cuphead. The running gun levels were sort of like Mega Man. Now it's about a cowboy. He's trying to save a princess, you know, the basic stuff. It has the similar type of story to a Mario game where it's very loose, but, you know, you're trying to go for a main objective. I found the platforming very floaty. It was even worse when you got into space, but it was pretty good. Now, this game actually isn't on my how long to beat yet because I'm still yet to play the sequel. But once I play the sequel, it will be right up on there. Now, the art style was amazing. It was a lot like crayons and pencils it was really cool i would like to see a bit more color but i've heard that the sequel has that and i can't wait to play the sequel now i did feel like the difficulty spike was a little weird because it felt like it went up right in the middle and then went back down again because the middle boss was insanely difficult however the last boss was insanely easy same with the levels. The levels in the middle were really difficult. There was this one spinning platform one that I had a ton of issues with. But I'd recommend this to a lot of people, especially if you don't really want to play Cuphead or you want to play an alternative to Cuphead. Play this game. It was really good. Here we have two games that were actually together. This is Delta Rune Chapter 1 and Delta Rune Chapter 2. So, these games are prequel, sequel, no one really knows, to another game that will appear later on this list. Now these games were really fun, they were kind of short, but aside from that they were pretty good. So the first one was themed around cards, the second one was themed around computers. I definitely liked the theme way more in the second one, however both were great. The music in both games lived up to the expectation of Undertale, it was amazing didn't get out of your head for years. Now, both of these had very interesting cliffhanger endings, and since they're free, I would recommend them to many people. All the characters have nice dynamics and development throughout the games, and the bosses are really well done. Also, I don't know if you would classify this directly as an RPG, but I mean, I guess you could. And I'm not a huge fan of RPGs, but I was a fan of this, which means it was a good game.
trailing off the last one we got on the tail. Now, this game has been popular for a while and it is known by many people as an amazing RPG. So, I completed a true pacifist run, the characters and story were pretty amazing. There wasn't any grinding unless if you played Genocide, which I did attempt, but I did find it a little difficult. And it was also extremely heartbreaking. Now, I picked this up for only $3, but I would honestly buy it for any price on any console because the dodging mechanics were great and it did not rely on luck like most RPGs and it was a lot of skill. So it was honestly really fun and the story and characters were amazing as many people have stated before. Alright, this is where the list to really get serious because all of these games are really good and they're all rated at a 90 or above at least on my scale. I think anyone should play them and they could all be interchanged. So, Wind Waker, what an amazing game. I've realized not many people have played this game because it's hard to get on the GameCube and not too many people own a Wii U, which makes me really hope that it's ported to the Switch. Now this is an amazing Zelda game that you should not miss. The dungeons were a bit bland and the bosses weren't very creative, except for the final one. And it was also a bit too easy at times, however my big problem was the Triforce Peace Quest, as it was extremely tedious and I had to do a lot of rupee grinding to actually figure it out. And I heard that they did fix this in the Wii U and if they port it to the Switch they should keep the changes to the Wii U. But it has the classic Zelda charm and it's insanely special, sailing the open seas are great. And it was really almost an open world experience to get to explore all these different islands. The graphics are beautiful and will probably virtually never age, and it's a must place for any Zelda fan whether it's the original or the Wii U one. One thing's for sure, I really do hope that it's ported. I don't know if you could notice, but this list does have a lot of puzzle games, and this one's probably the standout puzzle game. This was just amazing, the characters were great, the story was great, and the twist in the story was I mean, top notch. And the puzzles, the main focus of the game, don't even get me started on the puzzles. They're very momentum based, at least a lot of them are, and it makes it very fun to just fly through the air shooting portals around. But this is a sequel to Portal, and it does fix a lot of things that Portal didn't quite hit, because Portal is actually a very short game, whereas this one clocks in at around 8 hours, which made it a really fun and full experience. The ending is crazy. If you haven't ever played it, play it because this entire romp of the game is one of the funnest games that you will ever play. It's just constantly great. The puzzles, as I said, top notch. Just please play this game. I actually already did a video on this one and it ranks all the dungeons from the game and also gives an overall review, quite generalized though. So this one, really good. I think it was actually my first Zelda game, my first 3D Zelda game to complete. The first one was Link Between Worlds. So this one was great. Dungeons, man, so good. All of them were just like chef's kiss. So the puzzles and dungeons were okay. There were a couple dungeons that were a little miss. This story was really good. I really like that they introduced a new villain, even though it does kind of suck that Ganon was in charge of it all along. I think it should have been the other way around, actually. But, like, if you have a Wii, I'm surprised if you haven't played this or at least own it. And if you do have a Wii, like most people, and you haven't played it, go get this game. It's quite accessible. You shouldn't be able to find it for too much money as long as you're playing on the Wii and not the GameCube. You can also play it on the Wii U. I mean, it's a pretty basic Zelda game. It basically expands on everything from Ocarina of Time. I've heard a lot of people hate about the emoji controls. I didn't really mind because they're not too in-depth like Skyward Sword. You just kind of sit on the couch and whip your Wii remote around a little bit. So it was pretty good. It definitely would be better on the GameCube, but have you seen the prices for it on the GameCube? Anyways, you should probably play this. The graphics didn't age too well, but at least for me, graphics don't really matter as long as the game is a good one. Now you know how I said Twilight Princess was the first 3D Zelda game I beat? Well it's not the first 3D Zelda game that I got. 
because it was really this one. However, it got stuck in Lord Jabu Jabu's belly and could never continue the game. Which was honestly really depressing because playing it again, I would have loved this two years ago when I got it. The story was pretty good and this game is actually world renowned for being just amazing. I'm pretty sure it's the highest rated game on IGN or something like that. You should play this like all the other ones. It was really fun. Again, I liked all of the dungeons in it. They were pretty good. And the mass amount of dungeons really made the world feel open. Considering it was the first 3D Zelda game, it was quite open world. It was surprisingly open world, which was really fun. And I actually got this as an alternative to Breath of the Wild because I didn't have a Switch. And it did fulfill that Zelda craze that I had back then. So it was really fun. Anyone should play this. Now, I don't actually play RPGs that often, and the reason for that is not because of the story, not because of the characters, because I love both of those, it's because of the fact they have to spend meaningless hours of grinding, which is not fun. And this game, while well, remaining to be an RPG, really retained the fact of just straight fun. It introduced a whole new battle system rather than turn-based, different attacks take a different amount of time, and you have to really time that out, and you can also knock other enemies back. You can't really explain it that well unless you've played it. But almost everything this game does is perfection. Because as I said, I'd say I took about 20 minutes of grinding in this game, but it wasn't that much. But the player shouldn't be able to do too much grinding, I just kinda suck at games. As long as you do fight all the enemies that you run across in the path, you won't have to do it. The art direction? was amazing. This game was pure art with the watercolor factor. And the, the difficulty was just right for most of it, although the final boss was a little too easy in my opinion. The side quests were also carefully crafted and very fun to complete, and the overall package was amazing. So I think anyone should give this game a chance to see if it is their thing, and if it is their thing, they're gonna love it. The reason this one is so high is I played a lot of Zelda games this year, and a lot of Zelda games are very similar. Pretty nice because it was a completely different system. I actually avoided this game for a while because I did not think I would like the day system and the fact that there are only four dungeons, but I'm very happy that I played it because although there are only a few dungeons, all of them are really good except for the Great Bay, and the collectible masks and long side quests help balance it out a ton. I did not get all the heart pieces or stray fairies, but I did get all the masks and fully upgrade the sword, and I had a lot of fun playing this game, and the small amount of dungeons helps as if it had an alternative 8 dungeons, they would either have to limit side quest mask collection, which are the best parts of the game, or they could make the game stupid long, which I wouldn't be a huge fan of because I don't like my games being so long that I feel like I am going to be playing it for longer than 2 months. The game is really solid though, except for maybe the Great Bay Temple, because it's super confusing, and I kept messing up the way that the water goes. I think considering this one's a remake, I think they should have mapped the Elegy of Emptiness to like an item or button. It was really tedious to replay over and over again. I really liked how the land would change whenever you beat a dungeon in that area, however I was not a huge fan of having to refight the boss every time. Overall this game was really fun to beat, and I can't wait till the Switch Online Expansion Pass to play the original N64 one, which I heard is coming out next month. Before I played this game, I had always heard the expression that video games are art. However, I did not really experience that until I played Celeste. Now, Celeste is an insanely difficult puzzle platformer, and I say incredibly difficult because I mean it is incredibly difficult. Although, it didn't really matter to me that much because instead of restarting a whole level when you die, you only restart a screen and lose about 20 seconds at most. The only problem is with this, and this is kind of my problem by playing on the Switch, is using a thumbstick rather than something like arrow keys or a d-pad, which the Switch very much lacks a d-pad, meant it was really hard to dash in a specific direction, although you were able to get the hang of it after a while. My death count by the end of the game was just shy of 3500, which is pretty crazy, but I never really wanted to give up with the game and I was always filled with determination. This game is about climbing a literal and metaphorical mountain, which 
I mean, they had a great message about depression and that kind of stuff. And all the areas of this game were unique, and the music, beautiful. Best music in a video game by far. I honestly really want to replay this game, probably in about a year, just to get all the strawberries and, you know, beat chapter 9, which is known for being excruciatingly difficult, but I think I could do it with enough practice. If I got all the strawberries, did all the B size and the C size, I think I could do it. Anyways, I recommend this game to everyone I meet, because I just think that everyone should play it. Whenever I decide to play a game, I never actually come in with the intent of 100%ing it. Because I don't just go for the main story, I also go for the fun collectibles, but you know, getting all those Korok seeds would be absolutely painful. I don't want to put myself through it. I got a lot of the collectibles in Breath of the Wild, and I got a lot of the memories, but I didn't go for all the Korok seeds because I didn't want the game to turn out like a chore. However, I enjoyed every minute of it. So, my favorite part of the games were the dragons, the mazes, and Terrytown. And the game was exceptionally fun. You could get lost in this for hours. I would say this is a must-buy for every Switch owner if you haven't already played it. The game is incredibly immersive. One of the problem is, is it lacks proper dungeons, which I hope they can fit in the sequel, which I also can't wait for. Continuing on for that. This doesn't really feel like a Zelda game. Sure, the characters and locations are there, but it feels like a whole new game series or spin-off. I also don't really like the unoriginal bosses and Calamity Ganon felt way way too easy after you'd gone through all the game. I hope the sequel is able to feel more like a Zelda game coming from my part. To be honest, I do like the tool breaking mechanic because it keeps you quick on your toes there's a feeling like no other when your weapon breaks mid-battle. It's just a new sense of panic. I think this game had a ton of care put into it, although it's not perfect, sometimes it feels like it actually is. All the characters feel like real people that you could get to know, and it was really nice in a game this style. Also. The cell shading type thing that they did really felt like a nude style of Wind Waker, and you know how I like the Wind Waker style. Anyways, this, as I said, this game feels perfect, and it's pretty much whatever they wanted to do in Zelda 1, they poured into this game, and I can tell that they just poured hours of time into this game. I really think I should revisit it, hit all the shrines, although I am really excited for when Breath of the Wild 2 comes out this year and I'm sure I will do a review on it. Rise at the top of the list, we got Mario Odyssey. Now, you know how I said that I don't usually 100% games? Well, I actually 100% did this game, and I'm happy that I did. I didn't come in with the intent of 100%ing it, but when I completed the main story of the game in a couple hours, I knew I had to go back and collect every moon in every kingdom, which was an absolute blast. It never felt like a chore, it was never boring. The controls were tight in the game, the environments were stunning, and the music was really good too. This game is just plain fun. Whether you beat it or go f for a completionist route like I did, it was really good. This was actually one of the first real games that I've 100% completed along with Mario 3D Land. Because I don't like 100% games, as I said. A bit ago. Now Odyssey 999 moon count might seem daunting at first, but keep in mind the game takes about as long to 100% as it takes to beat the main story on Breath of the Wild. I feel like the main story is only about 12 hours at most so you miss a lot of the game. In Breath of the Wild you could play the game for 2 hours and feel like you've made a little dent in the story, whereas in Mario Odyssey, play for about 15 minutes, you feel like you've done a ton and you feel very accomplished because the moons are very attainable and easy to get it, except for about 25 really difficult ones. The final level poses a real challenge along with some of the moons, but it is easy to overcome just by practice. I think this should be the number one Switch game for everyone to own, because everyone can play and enjoy it. It is very accessible. So thanks, my Odyssey. Thanks for being one of the best games I've played in my life. Being, in my opinion, the best game I've played in 2021. <laughs>